This edition of my podcast is all about ISA 16, property, plant and equipment. Because although this standard has been taught and covered at the lower levels, it is still examinable at SBR and you need to know it because it does come up. Now, if you're doing FR, stay. If you're doing FR, everything I'm saying here is also useful and relevant for you at FR. So let's start at the beginning. Let's keep it simple. Let's cover the ground. When we talk about property, plant and equipment, we're talking about tangible assets. So they have a physical presence. You can touch them that have been acquired for use within the business, not for resale, but for uh, retention within the business to exploit and have an estimated useful life of more than one accounting period. Cars, buildings, computers, tables are all simple practical examples of property, plant and equipment. Every business will have them. Now, when you initially recognise uh, an item under PPE, you're recognising it at cost. What it costs you to buy it. Now, you would also capitalise, you would also include in that cost any installation costs, any delivery costs, any interest that you incurred in respect of borrowing money during the period of production if you were making that asset. A bit of ISA 23 thrown in there. You would also capitalise and include in the cost of the asset any decommissioning costs. So if you were obliged to... Uh, decommission the oil rig, to fill in the quarry, to tear down the building in 10 years time, the cost of doing that would be capitalised as part of the original cost of the asset. You would not capitalise training costs. If you subsequently spend money on that asset, if it's a repair or maintenance, that's an expense. But if you extend its life, if you refurbish it, if you renew it, if you extend it, that to me would be improvement and therefore you would capitalise that cost. There's an accounting policy around subsequent measurement because if you want to, you can revalue the asset and keep the valuation up to date uh, and, and you would also have to revalue all of the assets in the same class. So if you revalued one factory, you'd have to revalue all the factories. If you revalued one car, you'd have to revalue all the cars, although I'm not really sure why you would revalue cars. So you'd have to keep the valuations up to date. The accounting treatment for the revaluation gains and losses is basically to take them to equity. Although in some rarefied circumstances, you can end up taking revaluation gains and losses to P&L. You know, you would take a, a revaluation loss to the P&L after you've exhausted any previous revaluation reserve, any revaluation gain sitting in reserves in respect to that asset. And you would then take a revaluation gain to the PL if it was a reversal of a loss that had been previously charged to the PL. So a little bit fiddly there. Um, if you do revalue, of course, I can bring in the framework here. Some people would argue you're being more useful because you're being more relevant, because you're being predictive of the future cash flow. If you bring in an asset, at its fair value, you revalue the asset to its fair value, you're indicating the market value, you're indicating what you could sell the asset for. And that's relevant. And relevant is a fundamental characteristic of useful information. So you're making a prediction. However, there's a counter argument which says you're never going to sell your factory. You're never going to sell your head office. It's not the reason you've got the asset. Therefore, because you're not going to sell it, the business model is you're going to hold it. It's not really that useful to be disclosing a theoretical selling price when there's no intention to sell the asset. So there's always a debate. I say 16 allows you that choice. 
Where you've got no choice is depreciation. You have to charge depreciation on assets with a limited life. Obviously, land is not depreciated for that reason. But other assets, you know, cars, buildings have a limited life and we have to systematically write off the depreciable amount of those assets over their useful lives. Now, by depreciable amount, I mean the cost less the residual value. Because if you buy an asset for 10 and you think when you come to sell it, you'll get two, you only need to write off the eight. And if the asset has a four year life, then I would normally depreciate that evenly straight line two, 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 two each year. So that means after one year, the cost of the asset would still be 10, less the depreciation you charge in the P&L of two, net book value would be eight. The year after it would be six. Now that net book value of six is not what the asset is worth. That net book value of six is the cost, less the depreciation so far provided. Or it, it's the cost you've yet to allocate to future accounting periods. So depreciation is all about the matching concept, which is why even when you revalue the asset, you continue to charge depreciation on the asset because it continues to have a useful life, a limited useful life, and it's continuing to be consumed. Now, there's always a little bit of detail going on here. And when you've got an asset like a building, like land and buildings, they are complex assets. The land element is not depreciated and the building element may be depreciated at different rates because a building is perhaps a composite or a complex asset. There's the, the bricks and the mortar and the roof, but the lift shaft or the heating system may have a different useful life. So if you're told the building's going to last 50 years, but the lift is only going to last 10 years, then you would depreciate the cost of the lift over the 10 years, but the cost of the building, the rest of the building over a longer period. And something like that very recently came up in the SBR exam. Um, disposals. When you come to dispose of an item of PPE, you're de-recognizing it because you've sold it, you've scrapped it, or you've 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 put it, you've realized that it's you're not going to get any future economic benefit. If you've got some money coming in, there's a profit or a loss perhaps on that disposal. And what ISA 16 says is that if the asset has previously been revalued, there should be no recycling. There should be no reclassification of the balance in equity on the revaluation reserve coming back to the P&L. Let me give you a simple example. We've got an asset with a carrying value of 22. The cost was 10. And 12 is sitting in reserves as a revaluation. So the carrying value is 22. You've got 12 sitting in reserves and we're selling it for 23. The profit on disposal would only be one. The profit on disposal in the P&L would be the sale proceeds less the carrying value. The sale proceeds of 23 less the carrying value of 22. And the 12 that's sitting in reserves is not. The 12 that's sitting in equity is not reclassified or recycled to the P&L. Instead, it's simply shuffled. It's simply moved to retained earnings. Movement on reserves, not recycled. So there you go. You know, um, I hope you found that useful. Yeah, I hope you found that relevant. I hope you found that a, a faithful representation of I say 16. I hope you see what I've done there. If I can help you pass SBR. Yeah, if you want mocks that are marked, if you want feedback. Yeah, if you want WhatsApp support, if you want pass assurances, please reach out to me. I am here to help you pass SBR uh, at the ACCA exam. So, yeah, thank you very much for listening. Until next time.